Hi, and welcome to Jewish Insights. This past year, on the Saturday night before Rosh Hashanah, my brother-in-law, Avi Lieberman, called me. He said, we're going to Muncie. I said, why are we going to Muncie? He said, come with me to Muncie. We're going to go hear YY. I said, who's YY? That night, I had the amazing merit to go hear for the first time in my life Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak Jacobson, known to most as Rabbi YY Jacobson. I had never heard of him before, but once I got there, I felt like I had been living under a rock. He has this massive following, all these people who are learning from him across the globe. I Googled him, I learned more about him. I started following him on WhatsApp. I went to his website, theyeshiva.net, and I came to learn and to appreciate the amazing Torah he's putting into the world. As you'll hear from him, he's someone who grew up in the Chabad world. At age 17, he was asked to be the tra one of the transcribers for the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Um, and he is literally one of the premier Jewish scholars in both Torah and Jewish mysticism in America today. He has thousands of students, classes and lectures globally. He's all over the place, constantly traveling to try to teach people. He served as the editor-in-chief of the Algeminer newspaper, the largest Yiddish newspaper, uh, and he is the founder and dean of the yeshiva.net, if you want to learn more. Um, I'm so grateful, because I know that he is very sought after, that he's squeezed in. He just got in from Israel, I think this morning or last night, that he's coming in to sit with us today to share some of his Torah, share some of his insights as we prepare both for Pesach Passover and also think about what's going on in Israel today. I um, mean, he's really someone who provides advice to navigate both, I would say, personal and global challenges, which is a really hard thing to do. So, uh, Rabbi YY Jacobson, thank you so much for being here today. Really, it's thank you. It's my honor and privilege. So let's let's just start a little bit from the beginning. You know, where does the journey begin? You know, you're you're a YY now. People know you well, but where does it start? I guess when I was born, they <laughs> said, "Why, <laughs> why." <laughs> And I'm still trying to answer the question. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's like the question, you know, the first question God asks in the Bible and the Torah is to Adam is, where are you? Mm. Ayeka, where are mm. you? It wasn't just a geographical question. Yeah. It was an existential question. Yeah. Do you know who you are? Do you know where you are? Yeah. So how did you, how did you start to sort out? So I was born in, uh, I, I didn't sort out who I am. It's, it's, a couple, a couple working, nuggets towards. Working yeah. every day on it. You know, I found that uh, the greatest answer to the question who I am or who anybody is, is really when we can let go of the very question, when we can mm. let go of the ego and just become a channel for mm. the ultimate cosmic uh, energy. Wow. So I was born in, uh, in 1972 in Brooklyn. Uh, both of my parents, my mother and father, are immigrants from the former Soviet Union. Okay. They both grew up under the tyranny of Stalin mm. and the communist regime. Uh, their family suffered uh, horrifically. Uh, my grandfather was arrested, almost executed, tortured, sent to the gulag, but ultimately both families made it out. Wow. And uh, they made it to the United States of America. And uh, my parents got married here in the 1950s and they raised their family. I'm the youngest of five. They raised their family in Brooklyn, New York. My father was a journalist for 50 years. Uh, he was a correspondent of the Israeli daily, the largest Israeli daily, Yot Achronot in the UN. Mm. And uh, he worked for Yiddish and English newspapers here in the United States, and then founded his own Yiddish newspaper. I had the privilege of growing up at the feet of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. We grew up in the Crown Heights section of Brooklyn, New York. So I literally grew up at the feet of the Rebbe and uh, was very privileged to absorb uh, his talks and teachings and ideas and insights in my formidable years. And uh, today I have the very powerful and uh, profound privilege, uh, what I see as a profound privilege, to be able to teach these ideas, uh, mm -hmm. to share them with communities, Jewish communities and non-Jewish communities, mm -hmm. um, Jews from all backgrounds and walks of life, uh, secular and religious and very secular and very religious, mm -hmm. uh, both here in the United States and abroad and in Israel in different languages. So yeah, here I am today trying That's to it. be a channel. Right, I mean, and so I, I know many people who studied at the foot of Rabbi Soloveitchik I know no one who studied at the foot of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. You're the first person I've spoken to that has said that. So can you just tell me a little bit about like what that meant, what that looked like, uh, and you know, tell me about that experience. Yeah, it was, uh, it was certainly an extremely profound experience because uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, you know, he was born in 1902 in Ukraine. 
And essentially, he lived through, in a very intimate and direct way, the greatest revolutions of that era. He grew up in Tsarist Russia, 1902. You still have the Tsar mm -hmm. running the country. He grows up in a city called Nikolaev, Ukraine. His father becomes a chief rabbi, one of the largest cities in the Ukraine. He then experiences the Bolshevik Revolution, 1917. The Tsar is murdered. The Bolsheviks take over. There's a civil war in Russia. Ultimately, Lenin emerges triumphant between Lenin, Stalin, and Trotsky. Jewish life is completely transformed in the Soviet Union. What the Communist Party did to Judaism in 10 years, the Enlightenment couldn't do to Judaism in 200 years. Wow. The Rebbe ultimately flees Russia. He escapes Russia in 1928. Mm -hmm. And where does he move to? He moves to Berlin and he watches the rise of Adolf Hitler. Mm -hmm. So from Tsarist Russia wow. to Bolshevik Soviet Union, he comes to Germany. He's there when Hitler comes to power. And he experiences it firsthand. He then leaves Germany and moves to France. And when the Nazis occupy France in 1941, he escapes in the last boat with his wife. They never had children. And he makes it here to the United States of America in June 1941. And nine years later, his father-in-law, the sixth Lubavitch Rebbe, passes away. And the Rebbe, I should say, reluctantly, I don't think he really wanted the job. He studied uh, in Berlin and Paris engineering, mathematics. Mm -hmm. Um, he wanted to be an engineer, but he becomes Lubavitch Rebbe and probably the most uh, influential Jewish leader, uh, not just of this century, but probably of many centuries. As I once heard from Rabbi Sachs, the former, late former chief rabbi of Britain, that since the destruction of the Second Temple, he doesn't know if there was a leader who influenced and had an impact on every single Jewish community in the world. So that was the Rebbe's personal life. But, but together with that, he was an extraordinary genius. His mastery of all parts of Torah was incredible, but also his mastery of science and psychology and biology and physics and astronomy and cosmology, geology, was very, very profound and a unique mastery of both Jewish mysticism and Jewish law and weaving them together. So his presentations, almost every Shabbat and every holiday went for hours. These weren't half an hour sermons. And the Rebbe almost never used jokes or stories. So these were intense presentations that can go literally hours. I mean, Shabbos afternoon, he could speak for three hours, four hours, five hours, six hours, seven hours. Wow. And there were no tape recorders at the time. This was Shabbos. Right. And Shabbat and holidays, we don't use recording devices. Right. So everything had to be memorized. Wow. Everything had to be memorized. Sometimes the holiday would go for a few days. You know, two days of Rosh Hashanah, some Chastorah, Sukkot, yeah. Passover, together with Shabbat. So you can have 10, 15 hours of material that he presented. And this was profound, profound material. Existential, psychological, spiritual, halachic, uh, profound discourses on Talmud, on, on biblical explanations, Rashi, Tosvos, Maimonides, Zohar, all of the Hasidic and mystical literature, contemporary events, education, Israel, relationships. Uh, and most, and the, what was really profound was he would always show how every single idea in Torah has relevance in the emotional, psychological life of a person. So I was there from a very young age absorbing this, and uh, it was an extremely, I would say, transformative and historic experience every single time. Uh, the Rebbe's uh, uh, genius and profundity of ideas and, and relevance really it transformed my life completely. It transformed my understanding of Judaism. And when I was a teenager, I had the merit of joining the team of oral scribes. It was a small team of people, and their job was to memorize and then transcribe it th through the week. So that was extremely, it was an extreme, I still, I still Saturday night, I still have, my, my nervous system hasn't registered that it's been 32 wow. years. So I still have an anxiety Saturday night because I'm feeling the load of work wow. that I'm about to enter into. Um, memorizing it, teaching it, and then transcribing it. But today we have uh, dozens, actually hundreds of volumes of the Rebbe's talks and teachings because of this team of people. And uh, it went throughout all the years of his leadership until the Rebbe, you know, he had a stroke, he fell ill in 1992, and then he passed two years later. So this uh, really shaped a lot of my, I would say, my identity as a Jew, as a human being, my thought process. And today, really, I feel, you know, that I have the privilege of sharing a lot of that wisdom, at least the way it was filtered through my right. own imagination and creativity and life experiences to many people. Uh, the Rebbe had a very, very uh, unique combination of profound scholarship coupled with very, very intimate emotions. You know, you have people that have great minds, they're real geniuses, but the heart pales in comparison. The heart doesn't match the mind. And sometimes the opposite. You have 
titanic, gigantic hearts, but the mind doesn't match it. Right. The Rebbe had that profound uh, synthesis, having a heart that really f felt the heartbeat of the Jewish people in the world in such an emotional way, mm -hmm. but yet coupled with the tremendous vision. Also, you have people that have great vision, but they don't have the skills of translating it into the practical world. You have people who are very practical, but they don't see you know, the bird's eye view, the larger vision. Here again, the Rebbe had that combination and his care and concern for the people and for the Jewish people and for the world, it was really something that uh, it, it touched you in a profound way. I say with the one of, but, you know, if I, I think I would sum it up, you know, I would say, you know, we meet a lot of people in the world and sometimes we meet great people and we're touched by their greatness. And when we come out of a meeting with them or of a speech they give or a book they wrote, we feel how great they are. We feel how powerful they are, how interesting they are, how fascinating they are, how brilliant they are, whatever they are, how skilled they are. I think the Rebbe's greatest contribution is that when you came out of a meeting with him or a talk with him, you didn't feel how great he is. You felt how great you are. Mm. And that made all the difference. Wow. Uh, that was his uniqueness. Uh, when you stood in his presence, it was almost like he wasn't there. I never met a person that was so self-effacing. Mm. Even though he was a genius and he was world famous, in many ways, when you were in his presence, you didn't feel his existence. Rather, he had that ability of becoming a mirror to you, like allowing himself to become a springboard and a catalyst to show you who you were. Mm. And that had a tremendous impact on me because it really, he was one of those unique leaders who doesn't aspire to create students or disciples, but really to create leaders. Right. His greatest ambition was always for people to be ambitious. Mm. So that was something very unique. You have some of those great people, and they want to create students and disciples who yeah. are loyal to them. And certainly the Rebbe had lots of people who were loyal, but his greatest his I think his greatest message to empower people was, can you really own your power? Do you mm. realize your power? Take the ball and run with it. Mm. <laughs> run with it to... Uh, you know, to make a touchdown. Right. The world is yours to change and transform. And uh, that light that he ignited can't be extinguished because it wasn't his light. It right. was the light that he managed to ignite, I think, in me and in many other disciples. Wow, beautiful. So uh, one small clarifying question, which is, so does that mean he didn't prepare any of his speeches by hand? He didn't write them up? He it was very interesting. I think he prepared them, but not usual. Most people, they come and they come with notes. Yeah. He'd never used notes, never. So I think he prepared them. I don't think he prepared them in detail. In other words, every word he would say, I think he prepared the, the main ideas he right. wanted to discuss. Not always. I think yeah. sometimes he did not, but I think often he prepared it, but then he would begin to speak and there was a flow of consciousness and you could see how he's going from subject to subject. And he would quote from literally, you have scholars, they're focused on their theme. Mm -hmm. The Rebbe's scholarship was not limited to a particular part of Judaism mm -hmm. or Torah or life or intellect. Right. So, you know, suddenly he's quoting from Kabbalah and quoting from Hasidism and quoting from philosophy and quoting from psychology and giving an example in contemporary physics or science right. and then talk about something that's going on in the world and then talk about the challenges of relationships or education or Jewish identity or Jewish right. continuity. And then suddenly we'll analyze, you know, some story in the, in the Hebrew Bible and the Tanakh and then delve into a deep Talmudic discussion. And he didn't give us the footnotes right. earlier. He didn't give out a paper. He says, this is what I'm going to be talking right. about. You know, prepare, do your homework. No source sheet. <laughs> right. Like in many great yeshivas, the Rashi Yeshiva, those who give the Torah lectures, they give an assortment. I'm right. going to be talking about these three uh, sections of the Talmud. Go prepare. He did not do that. So right. you had to be prepared and really just have that uh, intellectual and emotional flexibility right. to be able to go down this journey. And it was a very, very powerful, powerful right. journey. I always felt that there's something historic happening. It was like Moses coming down from Mount Sinai and sharing wisdom. And we knew that if it's, we're not going to remember it and record it, it's right. going to be forgotten wow. forever. The Rebbe is not going to go and repeat it the next week again. Right. He, he's sharing. He's sharing from his soul. And uh, he was, he was, he was, you know, he was such, he was a, a very, very, I would say, above being a genius, he was a godly person. Mm. You did not feel any ego there. You really felt that he was a real channel for God, like just trying to be a channel for God and bring out the best in people and the best in the world. Um, I still get emotional, you know, when I think about that. You, you could see his sincerity, uh, the authenticity. He was, he was very, very intelligent, but not an iota of cynicism. Usually intelligent people, usually often intelligent people mm -hmm. are more cynical than other people because they, they, they see through facades. Right. They're not naive. They've been around the block. And the Rebbe has been around the block, to yeah. put it mildly. Yeah. From 1902 to 1994, he's been around the block. Right. And as a leader, he received hundreds of letters every day 
So he had his finger on the pulse, I would say, of every Jewish community on the planet, which was very, very unique. He sent emissaries there. He was involved. People wrote to him about all types of issues. Usually, at some point, you experience fatigue. Right. Uh, you become cynical. Sometimes you become bitter, maybe resentful. Certainly, you become jaded. Right. It's, you're exhausted, especially as you get older, you know. Let me just yeah. relax. Let me retire. Yeah. One of the unique things about the Rebbe is that his candle, it's like the Hanukkah, or his candle never stopped burning. It's like the burning bush, you know, yeah. the, the vision of the burning bush. He once explained as Moses was becoming a Jewish leader, and he was afraid of leadership. Moses was, was a mystic. Mm. Moses was a man of God. He wanted to remain in the desert right. and commune with God on a daily basis. He didn't need the leadership. He didn't need the attention, the validation. Right. You know, uh, egotistical or traumatized people need that validation, you know, tell me how good I am, tell me how famous I am, tell me how many likes I got and how many subscribers I have on YouTube so I can be a celebrity, so I can tell myself that I'm somebody. Yeah. But re people who are worked out, they don't live in that plane. So leadership is actually a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. and, and what God was telling Moses at the first encounter was, you see this burning bush? It's not gonna be consumed. Mm -hmm. When you become a channel for infinity, when you become an ambassador for God, you, the energy that you're channeling is infinite. So the tree burns and the fire will not be extinguished because you will not be consumed. And that, well, that's one of the most powerful messages of leadership that I have seen, I learned from the Rebbe, he embodied it. So even at the age of 89, I never can hear an ounce of cynicism. I can sometimes hear frustration, mm. a lot of pain, a lot of tears, but also a lot of joy and a lot of ecstasy, but never cynicism. There was this unwavering faith in the eternal destiny of the Jewish people and that goodness is going to prevail, that redemption is, go is unfolding, mm. and that the world ultimately, ultimately, even though it looks that way, is not a jungle. It was conceived in love, and each and every one of us is part of an indispensable mission to bring the world closer to a redemptive state of consciousness. That lack of cynicism was very inspirational for a young man like yeah. myself. Wow, wow! Yeah. Until today, you know, I'm a, I am, I am, I, I don't have that experience, obviously, like the Rebbe, but I've been around the block somewhat. I visited hundreds of communities. I get hundreds of emails, and most of them are not telling me how great life is. Mm -hmm. They talk about the pain of life, the corruption they experience, the abuse, dysfunctionality, and the entire gamut of what people experience. And uh, it's very easy just to become jaded, to surrender to this sense of either cynicism or, uh, you know, uh, I would say la certainly lack of enthusiasm and even despair. Mm -hmm. And at those moments, it's the Rebbe's presence, uh, the soul that he represented, what he showed me, what a person is, what a person could be, that really, it's, it's, it's even hard to describe in words. It just... It, it allows a fire to be ignited in my belly, not to become jaded, right. to realize that the story of life is not something that we can logically figure out. Mm -hmm. God created logic, he's beyond logic, and if we try to take, you know, if we try to force infinity into mathematical equations, we obstruct our ability to experience reality in its full majesty, mm -hmm. in its full pain, and in its full bliss. So there's an element of surrender to a higher reality that's beyond me, it's beyond my ego. And I think our greatest happiness is when we really become channels, when we can allow the ego to go out of the picture. Ego stands for, I always tell my students, easing God out. Mm. And when I can suspend it, and it's not easy because the ego is really a part of our survival. So we have to have a relationship with our ego. We need to talk to our ego with empathy. Uh, but ultimately, we want the ego to open itself up and say, the greatest happiness is when you're a channel, when you're an ambassador of infinite love and happiness and hope and healing and redemption. And then miracles happen through us, to us, and inside of us beyond what our egoic minds can control. So, I'm taking it all in here. I appreciate it. Uh, so. Are there, so you shared a couple of different things, kind of this idea of um, being self-effacing without being cynical, creating space for others, activating people to become leaders. Um, are you, can you think of examples of like how, so there's one thing to have that outlook. There's another thing to like embody that in a way that it affects others. Do, are there examples that come to mind where you saw either 
interactions with you or where you saw him interact with others, where you saw him make certain choices in the way that he either spoke or carried himself that like there was like a clicking moment for you there or something like are there specific examples of that? Yeah, I would say I would I would say every, every every day I saw the Rebbe or I heard him and I would hear him almost every single week and sometimes a few times a week because he he would teach often. Yeah, over many years, um, I I can see it again and again uh, his interactions with people. Uh, I'll give you an example, please. I uh, the Rebbe would Sunday would stand and distribute dollars for charity. Thousands of Jews would come from all over the world and non-Jews would come and they would get a dollar for charity and a blessing. And sometimes people would seek his counsel and advice and perspective and blessing. These were short meetings, but they lasted a whole day, a whole Sunday. And uh, I saw this once on a video, somebody whom I knew actually, he was a young man. He was very ill. He had a serious illness and he got online to see the Rebbe. And as he's approaching the Rebbe and the Rebbe was already in his high 80s, he does something very uncharacteristically, this fellow, uncharacteristic. He starts making with his finger to the Rebbe like you might make to a three-year-old boy okay. who's stealing the chocolate yeah. from the pantry and it's supposed to be for the guest, you know, and you're making with your finger like this, okay. which usually we wouldn't do even to an adult who's not the Lubavitcher Rebbe, right. or somebody who's triple our age, even if he's not the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Yeah. And yet, I guess he was very angry or frustrated or upset. Mm -hmm. Maybe he had that, you know, just intimate emotional, ex intense emotional experience. And he was going like this as he comes to the Rebbe. As he approaches the Rebbe, he's still going like this. And it was quite surprising. Mm -hmm. And he tells the Rebbe just a few words. He says, I am so disappointed with you. Those, that's not usually what people would tell the Lubavitcher yeah. Rebbe. Yeah. You know, they would thank him. They right. would bless him. They would ask for a blessing. Usually that was yeah. the case. They would ask for advice, not tell him how disappointed they are in him. Mm -hmm. But that's what he said. I don't know why he was so disappointed with the Rebbe. It could be he felt that the Rebbe somehow could have schlepped him out of his illness and did not. I'm not sure. Th sure. Those would be my own speculation. And the Rebbe looks at him. And I am... My heart stops from when I want to know how the Rebbe is going to respond. Like, yeah. I'm thinking about myself. If somebody would come over to me and say, Rabbi, why, why? I am so disappointed with you. Yeah. I actually may be annoyed. I may be frustrated. I may even be resentful. I'm not going to tell them I'm annoyed. You know, I'm a gentleman. I'll smile. I'll say, tell me why. But inside, yeah. I will not like it. You know, the compliment sits much better. It resonates much more. And I, I see, and the Rebbe looks at him and repeats his words. So you're, you're very disappointed with me. Mm -hmm. And the Rebbe looks and says, you know, I second that because I'm also very disappointed with myself. And that was the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I could see his sincerity when he said that. Mm -hmm. There was no ego there. Mm -hmm. Like, you're disappointed with me. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm with you. I'm disappointed with myself too. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, this person was a Chabad Chassid. Mm -hmm. So he was a follower of the Rebbe. In many ways, I felt that the Rebbe was telling him, you know, I'm with you in your disappointment. I'm your Rebbe, even as you're disappointed with wow. me. You know why? I'm also disappointed with me. So we're still, we could still connect. Yeah. But what a lesson for parents and children. You know, sometimes our children come to us, especially as teenagers. Tati, mommy, I'm disappointed with you. We often get, you know, we become egotistical. Like, this chutzpah, you know how much money I spent on your education, on your therapy? You know, first pay me back $900,000, and then we'll talk about how, you, you know, we get there. And even if we're not, you know, maybe so narcissistic, but very often it becomes, you know, him versus me, her versus me, and this lack of appreciation and what happened to respect. And you think, I spoke like this to my father and my mother. They also had issues. And you think, I said it. We repressed everything. We didn't tell anybody. Command me, respect you, whatever. All these good sermons. From the Rebbe, I learned at that moment, what if you can be there with your child in their frustration? You don't have to be scared. My ego, my trauma, my wounds create this coping mechanism where I have to remain, you know, ascetic, I have to remain above, I have to remain aloof, because if I'm with you, you know, I may fall apart. Right. <laughs> it's a form of emotional suicide. But what if we can actually breathe in our internal divine selves, which it's not made up from the chemistry of egotism. It's not made up, it's made, made up of the chemistry of infinite light. Mm. So I can actually be there with you. I can be humble. I can, I can challenge myself. Mm. And that allows me to open myself up to so much more opportunity, to so much more creativity. That was a very, very powerful lesson for me. I'll tell you something interesting. The last time I saw the Rebbe mm -hmm. was Sunday. It was a Sunday. It was a March, 1992. Okay. The Rebbe would give dollars every Sunday. And I would usually not go because I grew up in Crown Heights and there were thousands of people going. Why should I be somebody else on the line? I didn't feel it was fair to him. Right. But that Sunday night, I was going to Israel for a wedding of a cousin. This is March 92. So I went to get a dollar. And uh, 
I heard the Rebbe on Shabbat, the Shabbat before, because there was a very big fabreng and a gathering, and he spoke for a long time, and I have transcribed it, but this was Sunday evening. And I went to 770, that was the headquarters of the Chabad, where the Rebbe lived, and uh, I got online. This was already six, around 6 or 6.30 p.m., so he was standing for seven hours. He was 89 years old. He would stand, and he's seen thousands of people, men and women and children from all demographics, and spoke to them and listened and responded and gave counsel and blessing. And I'll never forget this. Right in front of me, there was a girl. She looked like four years old. She seemed French. Mm-hmm. And her father was holding her. They seemed like a secular French Jewish family. Okay. That's what it seemed to me. And they went, they were right in front of me. And the Rebbe gives this little girl in her father's arms uh, a, a dollar. And she looks him right in the eyes. I'll never forget this. And she screams out loud. She says, Rebbe of Lubavitch, I love you. Uh, I saw some of his secretaries, felt a little awkward. It wasn't yeah. usually yeah. what a girl, <laughs> what you would expect a girl to tell the Rebbe, yeah. you know. So, so I saw some people felt a little, a little awkward, but the Rebbe's face lit up. Uh, he was, his face was shining. There was a smile that was radiating from his, from his holy countenance from ear to ear. And he, he looks at her and he says, thank you very much. And he gives her a second dollar. As they're about to leave, he gives her a second dollar. And he says, this is for your love. Right after that was my turn. The smile was wiped off his face. Uh, <laughs> his secretary told, me, told him I'm going to uh, the Holy Land that night. And he gave me a dollar. He said, blessing and success. And then he gave me a second dollar. And he said, lots of, uh, you should give this for charity in the Holy Land. The next day, he suffered a stroke at the resting place of his father-in-law. He would go twice a week to the grave site of his father-in-law in Queens. And that's where he would pray and he read thousands of letters that he would receive. And he would pray there at the grave of his father-in-law. The next day, Monday, uh, I still remember, it was the 20, 27th day of Adar, Adar 1, uh, 1992. That's uh, 5752 in the Hebrew Jewish calendar. He was praying there and he had a stroke and then he fell down. He fell down there. So these were the last words I heard from the Rebbe, literally. This is, this is for your love. To be able to see that interaction, you know, a four-year-old girl coming to this great Jewish leader, and he thanked her for telling him yeah. how much she loves him and appreciates him, and then gives her a dollar, this is for your love. Um, it, was, it was just, it was so simple. It was so authentic. It was so vulnerable. And it also taught me a message. It taught me in many ways, I felt like this was a mission of mine. That wherever I go, wherever I travel, I should be able to be a channel for this type of love. Mm. Because, you know, that's how we heal the world. That's how we heal our people. Mm. With that, uh, that dosage of, of infinite divine love. That's why I went, you, you alluded, again, so much there. I feel like I'm, you're, it's a fire hose for me right now, and I'm appreciating literally every second of it. So thank you. Um, thank you. You alluded a little bit, and it, it comes to the, the story at the end as well. You alluded to kind of the way generations have changed a little bit, that, you know, we say that, like, I would have never said that to my parents or never said that to my grandparents. Maybe every generation says that. I don't know. Um, but there's certainly, I think, those who are in Chinuch and those who are in parenting, there seems to be a sense now that, like, children are running the show more than they did in previous generations and that there isn't that sense of, you know, getting up to walk parents out or, or that respect um, or that sense of, you know, almost we've gone too far that people are kind of so want their children to say they love them so much that they're willing to like acquiesce and to bend towards whatever they need. And I just know that's another area I know that you've spoken on a few words on kind of what you see in the trends of parenting and what advice you have um, for people that yeah. are struggling with that. Well, this is a very, very hot and contemporary issue because there's really, there's two perspectives and I would say on two extremes. You know, one perspective is we ruin the young generation mm-hmm. in our obsession to get them to love us and like us and appreciate us and become friends with us. We have lost the art of discipline and being straightforward and creating a line between right and wrong and truth and falsehood. And this is a father and this is a child and you do what I say and there is a master in this house and there is discipline and you follow the right behavior. And in many ways, that's what makes children happy and it makes them fulfilled. It's almost like we allow them to run the world and run the life and and they're miserable anyway. They're anyway miserable. That's one perspective. And another perspective, you know, talks about feeling their pain and understanding their traumas and understanding their wounds and being sensitive to them. But I think it's so important not to pull the string in one extreme and another extreme. I think the fact is that 
in previous generations, there may have been much less awareness or maybe much less mental space mm. to be able to deal with the inner wounds. There was so much crisis happening every day. There was such a need to simply to struggle for survival. Mm -hmm. People faced adversity, sometimes in horrific ways. I mean, I know about my parents' youth. Right. I, you know, my, my grandfather was taken away from the house in the middle of Kiddush Friday night in 1938 by the communists uh -huh. and thrown into prison. My father was four years old and now he's without a father and his baby brother is without a father. And it would take years until they would find out his father is alive until he would be liberated from Stalin's gulag. Right. Let's just understand this. First of all, he doesn't even know if his father is alive. Right. The fact that he doesn't have a father, you know, so what type of trauma does that create? You right. know, what does that do to our emotions? Do we have to disassociate emotionally in order to be able to survive? And can we be aware of this? Mm -hmm. So perhaps in a previous generation, there was much more struggle and the focus was put one foot ahead of another foot right. and forge ahead and let's rebuild Jewish life with tenaciousness and commitment. And for that, we have to be in awe to an entire generation who chose life over death, mm -hmm. survival over becoming extinct, building families after a horrific Holocaust, building Israel, building Jewish communities in the diaspora, we have to be in awe. But I think it doesn't take away from the fact that we could be sensitive to the truth that many of us grew up without a deep focus on understanding what's happening inside of us, what our triggers are, mm -hmm. that we should be able to connect to our loved ones in a much more authentic and vulnerable way. And that's what we want to give our children today. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm certainly, I understand, I think real attachment doesn't exclude discipline. It includes discipline, but it's a discipline that comes with deep awareness. If my child is triggering me very deeply, just to ignore that and ignore my anger and frustration and resentment is not enhancing the relationship. It's actually depriving the relationship from being real and deep and authentic. Mm. And I think real Torah values is that we create a home with values, values that are based on integrity and authenticity. And as we call it in Judaism, you're at Shemayim, the, the acknowledgement, the presence of God mm -hmm. and our duties and responsibilities in the world, but coupled with a very deep sense of emotional attunement mm. to what our children are going through at every stage of their life yeah. and allowing them to become truly authentic people. And I think in our generation, I am not of the opinion that we have this spoiled generation of kids who feel entitled. There may be truth to some truth to that, but I think we have a generation of children who are actually yearning for a much deeper, authentic relationship. Mm with God, with Judaism, with their parents, with their community, and they're not allowing us to get away with a much more superficial relationship mm -hmm. because many of us have not learned to deal with our emotions. We don't deal with our own stuff. Mm -hmm. We're not dealing with our own stuff. So it's like, let's just make it look good. And they say, no, Tati, you're miserable. You are miserable. Mm -hmm. Are you a really happy person? Is your marriage with mommy real? Right. Or it just looks good. You're making a living, you're supporting us, you're sending us to good schools or good universities. But deep inside, have you dealt with your emotional traumas? And I think if all of us would have that courage and humility and resilience to be able to be curious about all those triggers that we're experiencing in our marriages and our relationships with our children and our relationship with ourselves, we'll become much better people. We'll become much better parents. You know, I've told my students something I once read, you know, Passover is coming. And one of the great customs of Passover, I don't know, it's thousands of years. It's like one of those enshrined customs in most Jewish homes, but we don't know why it is. And the custom is, of course, we have the afikoma. We have that broken matzah. Mm -hmm. The parents, the father, or the mother hide the matzah. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, our children discover it. And they demand a prize in order to give it back to us. In my days, it used to be, you know, potato chips or a black and white cookie. If you were a rich family, if you were a Rothschild, you asked for a Parker pen. Right. Today, it's more like a Lamborghini or a private plane, a private jet, a private yacht. If not, they'll call child services right. on you. But what, what's, what's the depth behind this custom? The depth behind this custom is very, very meaningful. It's telling us, Tati, Mommy, Daddy, Mom, Pop, Mom, Abba, Ima, whatever you guys hide, your children are going to reveal. And we sometimes invest a lot of years and a lot of brain power mm -hmm. to hide stuff, mm -hmm. not just from them, from ourselves. It goes into our subconscious. And that's our afikom, and it's the broken matzah, it's the broken parts of our lives that we have hidden away 
and they're very, we are very successful in suppressing them or repressing them and keeping them under the couch. Yeah. And then our children come, and guess what? They find the Afrikaimen and they say, here, here, Tati, here's your Afrikaimen, here's your broken matzah. And I would say, wow. how we respond to that moment really defines the future of our lives and their lives. Either I look at my child and I say, how dare you? How do you have the chutzpah to take something I worked so hard on repressing for so many decades and you're exposing it? I may not say it consciously, but I may say it unconsciously and I'm feeling uneasy in this relationship. Or I may humbly look at my child and say, wow, thank you. Thank you for bringing this to my attention. Thanking, thank you for allowing me to become a better person, to work on my broken pieces, to work on my broken parts, mm. to realize that my soul came down to repair mm. my animal consciousness, to repair my body. The soul has a mission. If I'm struggling, it's because I'm engaged in a mission. Show me a person who's not struggling, and I'll show you a person who's not fulfilling their mission. They're not fully alive. If I'm perfect, there was no reason. My, our soul came down here for a purpose. Mm. The Tanya says, Tanya is one of the great works of Jewish spirituality and mysticism. It's the it was, found, it was written by the Chabad founder, Rabbi Shneir Zaman of Liadi. So it's like one of the basic books of Jewish spirituality and Hasidism, and certainly of Chabad. And he says there, the soul itself is divine. It's a derivative of divine infinite consciousness. It doesn't need tikkun, it doesn't need fixing. Hmm. It came down to bring healing to our coping mechanisms, to our, what he calls animal consciousness, to our body. So this is the work that I need to do with my own broken matzah. And my child just gave me the opportunity. And then if I can say thank you to my son or my daughter and embrace my afikoman and internalize it, you know what happens? Together, we can declare, l'shana haba'a b'yerushalayim. Mm. We can engage on a true journey to redemption. Next year in Jerusalem. Right. Right. So um, I, I want to just one step further. I'm a, I'm a Musser guy, as you know, so I'm very practical with these things. So I'm so moved by what you just shared, and I can think of lots of ways to apply it. But, you know, in terms of someone hears that from you and they want to live differently the next day, is that you need to go to therapy? Is that you need to, you know, fight with your spouse in front of your kids so they see what's going on? Like, you know, what, how does one put that into their life? That that's exactly that. That's, that's the most important question. Yeah. You know, what's, what's the visceral experience of this? What does it look like? Yeah. And I think it's really not what, specifically one thing or another thing, but mm -hmm. I think it's a host of things. For example, generally, it's the ability to be able to pause and breathe before we react. Mm -hmm. Viktor Frankl said, between stimuli and reaction, there's a moment mm -hmm. There's a moment, mm -hmm. and that moment, that moment lay the potential of all human freedom. You know, my child said something to me, my wife said something to me, my teenage girl said something to me. Before reacting, can I pause? Mm -hmm. Can I breathe? Can I watch what's happening inside? Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, it's a general relationship with myself. Are there moments that I meditate, that I work on myself, that I pray, that I go inside? that I become aware of what's happening inside of me and how I am reacting. Because when I become aware of these things, I become aware of my neural pathways, I become aware of my patterns, of my emotions, of my instincts, of my thoughts. It's the only time I could start making choices. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I need therapy. Sometimes I need the assistance of a professional, a mental health professional, whatever the capacity is, to be able to help me aware of things. Sometimes I need the help of all of the various healing modalities that I think God has blessed our generation with. There's so many new healing modalities. Mm -hmm somatic healing and energy healing and sometimes plant healings for trauma that can help people really get in touch with layers of themselves, sometimes subconsciously that I didn't know. I didn't know about all my triggers. I didn't know how angry I am. I thought I'm not an angry person. I thought I'm Mr. Chill. And then suddenly, suddenly, you know, you get exposed to the truth. The more we have a relationship with ourselves, and we need a support system for this. I think we also need real people in our lives, real confidants. It could be a spouse, it could be a best friend, it could be friends, it could be a teacher, a rabbi, a therapist. People that we can really, really, really be honest with. I think we need a very deep relationship with our soul or a deep relationship with God. Um, I think we have to also focus on our bodies. Our bodies, our nervous systems are what, you know, Judaism calls our Beit HaMikdash. You have the mm. divine presence, the Shekhinah dwelled in a home, in a Beit HaMikdash. Mm. Our body is the Beit HaMikdash. It's a temple. It's a sanctuary that houses the divine presence, which is the divine soul. 
you have to honor the Bet HaMikdash. In fact, the Torah gives us a prohibition. You're not allowed to demolish even one brick, even one stone in the Holy Temple. It's one of the prohibitions. Our body, Maimonides writes, Maimonides lived in uh, the 12th century. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he was a great physician and a great philosopher, but considered the greatest, one of the greatest Jewish sages and, and halacha codifiers of all time. And he says that the body should be healthy and wholesome is one of the ways of God. Mm-hmm. So in Judaism, that synthesis, if, 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 my, if, I, if there's no body awareness, and I have to say the truth, you know, I grew up in a very, very intellectual environment. Mm-hmm. There was very little body awareness. Mm-hmm. The focus was learn, 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 learn. And, you know, we know the Jewish obsession with learning. And it's amazing. And it produced Nobel Prize. I'm not going to now discuss how many Jews won Nobel right. Prizes because lots of Jews do that. You know, 30% of Nobel Prize winners went to Jews and we're not even a quarter of 1% of civilization. Right. And it's amazing. The people of the book and learning is everything. Sure. But what about the vehicle? the vehicle, the container. Mm-hmm. The nervous system is the bridge between the mind and the body. If we don't regulate our nervous system, if we're not in tune with those parts of ourselves, I don't think we can heal ourselves. I don't think we can fix ourselves. Yeah. So I think it's you know the practical thing of a person to do when they want to approach this is begin with time and energy that we really focus on healing, on inner redemption, on mm-hmm. opening up our own blockages. We have so many blockages and we don't need to live with those blockages. For many of us, it's survival. I know myself, I have blockages that I have developed at a very, very young age. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, to give you one example, I have done very well in yeshiva. You know, I was considered a genius in yeshiva. Mm -hmm. I did very well. Today, I know that a lot of it was a coping mechanism Mm -hmm. in order to get the validation Mm -hmm. and respect that I needed for survival. Mm -hmm. And I think the more each of us can really go into that space and see what type of coping mechanisms that I developed, maybe at a very young age, not even aware of of what I did. And that brought me the fame, the success, the money, the respect, the awe, the reverence, the love. I call it fake love because validation is not real love. Mm-hmm. It's fake love mm-hmm. that I desperately needed to get. Right. If we can work on all these stuff, then we can open ourselves up to something that's under all of it. And that's the true self. Mm-hmm. The true self is a divine consciousness. It's a derivative of Hashem. It's a derivative of God. Mm-hmm. It's your most powerful, infinite self. It's indestructible. It is filled with love and compassion and it's always whole no abuse in the world no molestation in the world no dysfunctionality in the world Mm -hmm. no developmental trauma in the world can traumatize the soul Mm -hmm. the body can be traumatized the brain can be traumatized the nervous system can be traumatized and we have to heal those things but the soul may be hidden but not traumatized Mm -hmm. and when i could open up myself to my soul there is infinite bliss And there's infinite creativity because it's a piece of God. And there's infinite wisdom and wholeness. And that's where real relationships happen. And that's where I could connect to my wife and to my children Mm -hmm. and to myself Mm -hmm. and to other people, my loved ones, in the most powerful, powerful way. It's where the self and the selflessness converge. The self is not about the ego. The ego is a counterfeit self. Mm -hmm. The ego and the coping mechanism, which may include my insecurity, my narcissism, my fear. By the way, sometimes uh, insecurity looks humble, but it's actually ego. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's, it's, I I so don't know who I am. I so don't appreciate myself. So my ego becomes insecure. That's how I survive. I survive by becoming a people's pleaser. Mm -hmm. Can you like me? Can you like me? Can everybody like me? Can I do exactly the right and perfect thing? I look like the kindest person in the world. It's really a form of feeling so detached. Mm. When you really love yourself, you love your soul, you're a derivative of God. You, you need to be yourself. Right. You can't live for other people. Mm-hmm. That's not going to be you. You're not even going to be really kind. My kindness is coming from my insecurity. You know, this journey of self-discovery, um, which is really the core of the book of Tanya that I mentioned earlier, I find to be one of the most meaningful aspects that I get from, from, from Judaism it's a whole different life. When I'm in that space, when I could function from that space, there is honesty, there is authenticity, there's vulnerability. I'm not afraid of all the pieces in in, in, in myself. And, and a very important part here is, and this is very, very strong in the Hasidic tradition of Jewish spirituality, is that we don't amputate any parts of ourselves. We don't look at our ego or our coping mechanisms or our animal soul as evil. Mm-hmm. Like, you're destroying my life, get out of my life. Because each part actually is saying something. Mm. Each part, today there's a, 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 you know, a school in psychology known as IFS, Internal Family Systems, Richard Schwartz, and I was talking to him about this. We had an interview online 
about the, the IFS and the Tanya. And a very fascinating idea in, 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 in Hasidic spirituality is that every part in us, even what we find to be evil and toxic and destructive, and it is, mm-hmm. underlying it, there's an innocence. There's a purity there that has been blocked, that has been diverted, that has been camouflaged, that has been manipulated, that has been exploited. So we don't have to be ashamed of any part of ourselves. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is invite it into the conversation and with empathy, try to understand what is really going on. There's something that my anger is covering. Mm -hmm. There's something that my anger or my frustration or my hatred or my shame or my anxiety, there's something it's covering up. Mm -hmm. There's something it's trying to protect me from. Mm -hmm. In other words, at the surface, it may be very destructive. Deep and down, deep down, there's an innocence there. There's a purity there. So when we can bring all the parts of ourselves into the the conversation, so it's almost like a conversation between many people around the table. The Tanya gives a beautiful illustration. He says, you know, when you go to a court, there's a jury, right? So he says, this one has this opinion, and this one has this opinion, and this one has this opinion, and then there's a judge. And he says, look at yourself that way. Inside ourselves, there's so many different parts, and everyone has an opinion. Mm. And this one says, you know, blow up, detach, disassociate, get angry, break the window, punch him in the nose, run away to New Zealand, Mm. uh, shut down. You don't need anybody in the world. You're just independent macho. Mm. Uh, This person is your enemy. It's all going on. And like, Mm. oh, wow, wow, thank you, thank you, thank you. And and everyone wants full control. Mm. But when we're aware of all this, we can actually allow our highest self, our core self, our divine self Mm -hmm. to be the judge Mm -hmm. and say, I got you all. I hear you. Thank you for your opinion. I know where you're coming from. (laughs) And now let's give the verdict. And that verdict doesn't come with amputating any part of ourselves. So there's a relaxation there. There's a serenity there. There's realizing that every part of ourself is serving a purpose. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So talk me through the example you gave. You know, you mentioned that one of the things you noticed about yourself was that you you seeked validation when you did well in yeshiva. Yeah. So when you kind of had I that. Got, I got yeah, validation. Yeah, and you got it, and got it. I got it. So when you had that moment where you realized that about yourself, what did you do with that information? Right? You didn't amputate it. So what did you do right. with it? Right. I, I still have to deal with it today, mm-hmm. you know? When, when I come, I was just in Israel, and uh, I was going to Tel Aviv. Uh, this is... Uh, this, this week, I was going to Tel Aviv in the morning. There was a podcast. It's a very, very popular, one of the five most popular podcasts in Israel. It's called The Biology of Winners. And an Israeli Jew, a secular Jew, his name is Eitan Azaria. He asked me to come on and he wanted to interview me actually about the Hasidic approach to life. Mm. The tradition of Hasidism, of Hasidus, of Tanya, of, of the Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe, etc. And, you know... I thought I was calm, but on the way there, there was a lot of traffic, so I got delayed, of course. You go to Manhattan, there's traffic. You go to Tel Aviv, there's traffic. You go, you know, if you want to get somewhere to important places, there's yeah. going to be traffic. Um, as I was getting, as I was getting uh, uh, closer, suddenly I felt this anxiety. Did I prepare well? What if he asks me these questions? Do I have an answer? What am I going to say? What am I going to say? And then I realized there was a part of me that was worried about how I'm going to come out of this. Am I going to look good? Is he going to want me back? Is he going to be blown away? Is he going to be impressed? Are people going to like it? Are people going to hear it and say, wow, that was incredible or not? And I had to really tune into that voice and give it empathy and say, I know I'm, I'm so sorry that this is what you need to do. Make me anxious in order to survive. But this is a voice inside of me that is very worried for my survival. It's very worried that if I don't come out perfect, mm-hmm. what's going to be? What's going to be left? You're not going to like me. He's not going to like me. She's not going to like me. And what I did was I acknowledged it. I gave it a little love. I gave it a little compassion. I understood it. I didn't get angry at it. Mm-hmm. And then I said, but I don't think we have to go there. Mm-hmm. I, I, I get your message. I don't think we have to go there. I think the most powerful and best thing I can do is show up with authenticity, with vulnerability, and realize that I just want to be a channel for all the wisdom and love and truth that God is going to send through me today. Mm. It won't be perfect. I promise you it won't be perfect. Mm. I'll make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow I may say, oh, I could have given a better answer. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I'm going to show up Mm -hmm. with the tools God gave me today Mm -hmm. to be able to be a channel for whatever wisdom I'm going to merit to be a channel for today. Mm. And It was such a liberating experience. Mm -hmm. And every time I get up to give a lecture or a speech anywhere around the world, I can hear these different voices. Mm -hmm. There's a voice that's always waiting for the compliment. Is there going to be a standing ovation? Mm -hmm. 
Can you come to me and tell me that was incredible? Can you please tell me this was the best lecture you ever heard in your life? Or at least a second to the best lecture. No, the best lecture you ever heard in your life. Mm-hmm. There is that voice. And then I remember what it says in Tanya. The need for compliments. I don't mean compliments in order to give constructive criticism, like to realize where I could do better. That's good feedback. But the obsessive need for you to compliment me versus you to criticize me is really coming from a place in the self that feels lonely. Mm. It feels detached. It feels like it has to create a counterfeit ego in order to survive, where the truth is that I'm really just a channel of God's infinity. Mm -hmm. Everything is God's reality. I'm just a channel of His light, and I manifest it Mm -hmm. through the way God wants me to manifest it, which includes my brain, my heart, my soul, my imagination, and my being. And I just want to show up to be a channel. The great Hasidic masters compared the person, the healthy person, to a chauffeur. Mm -hmm. What's a chauffeur? A chauffeur is, that's why on Rosh Hashanah we blow the chauffeur. Chauffeur the ram's horn. The chauffeur doesn't create the sound. The chauffeur channels it. And when the chauffeur channels it, I blow. If the chauffeur is hollow, if the chauffeur is plugged, the sound will get stuck. Mm. The chauffeur is hollow, the vibration, the sound will travel through the chauffeur and its resonance will go from the narrow side to the broad side and enlighten and inspire the entire community with the chauffeur. And the Maggid of Mizrichi was the successor of the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, said that basically Rosh Hashanah is the day that God blew, or not blew the soul into Adam and Eve. So God blew the shofar. Who is the shofar? Adam and Eve. We are the shofar. We are the channels for the divine energy. The greatest challenge is can my shofar be hollow? Can it be egoless? Mm. If my ego is there, you know, I block the sound. I block my creativity. If I want to be creative and I'm obsessed, I got to be perfect. I got to be amazing. I got to be, I'm actually not creative. <laughs> I'm just in this place of, of, of fear. Mm-hmm. If I could say, you know what? I don't need a compliment, actually. Mm-hmm. You don't, no one has to tell me how good it was. Mm-hmm. Of course, I still like compliments and I like to get positive feedback. I'm not a self-effacing, completely individual, but it's, it's tuning into that part of me. I don't need a compliment. Mm-hmm. And if you compliment me, great. And if not, it's perfectly fine. I'm just going to be a channel. And the more the I becomes a channel, the channel doesn't need compliments. Mm-hmm. In fact, the compliment may take me away from my power. You're actually making believe that Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson is this separate, detached, mm-hmm. isolated, lonely creature who's dependent on your compliment. No. Mm-hmm. The real Rabbi Y.Y. is the Rabbi Y.Y. who's a channel for God's infinity. Mm-hmm. So actually, do me a favor, don't talk to me about me because you're not helping me. You're actually minimizing me. You're putting me into this little box. You know, it's like I'm standing in front of the Pacific Ocean or in front of the Atlantic Ocean, you know, watching this incredible, incredible display of, of, of God's ocean with all the majesty and richness and royalty that the ocean represents. And I insist on reducing the entire ocean to one bottle of water. And I take a bottle of water and I fill it up with water and I stick myself into the bottle and I put a lid on it. And that's what I do. You know, we are the ocean. We, we, are, we are channels of, of infinite energy. Our body is the bottle. It contains the water through my body. You know, I always say, really what death is, you know, Judaism doesn't believe that death is the ultimate reality where we just die. It really means that the water gets poured back from the bottle into the ocean. Mm. Life in this world simply means that the bottle is containing the water. The last thing we want to do is put a lid on it Mm. and separate the water in the bottle from the water of the ocean. Mm. When I'm focusing on me, that's what I do. I put a lid on my bottle and I detach myself from the source of creativity. Mm-hmm. It's like all I have is that little water in the bottle. Pour me. Mm-hmm. You know, open the lid. Open the lid. That's the idea of mikvah. The whole idea of mikvah is we go back into the source and we don't create that separation. So, but these voices will continue to exist in me as long as I live, I assume. <laughs> and, and it's really noticing them with compassion, understanding what they're trying to do. And really realizing that that's the whole purpose. The whole purpose is to bring the truth of God's oneness into my ego, Mm. into my brain, into my neural pathways, into my nervous system. There's a beautiful expression in the Midrash. God created the world so that we can create a home for Hashem, a home for infinite love in the physical world. Mm. And every one of us has an opportunity to do that every single day. Mm. To take our physical bodies, our physical homes, our physical workplaces or our environments and really infuse them with these truths 
of oneness. And, and it's this that allows for marriages to function so much better. Mm-hmm. Imagine I don't have to be defensive when my wife criticizes me. Mm-hmm. How cool is that? I don't have to be defensive when my children talk to me. I don't have to be defensive when anybody talks to me. I can actually show up. I can show up. And it's not because I'm a shmata, I'm a worthless nobody. On the contrary, a a real person who's in touch with their soul protects their boundaries because it's not my own boundaries I'm protecting because I'm narcissistic. It's the boundaries of integrity that I'm protecting so I should be able to be me. Mm I should be able to be me. And I would say that all of Judaism, in many ways, according to the Tanya, is really being plugged in to the source of the divine electricity. And I don't want to pull my plug out. Mm -hmm. And I have to make a choice. Will I pull my plug out, and then the refrigerator is just a dead refrigerator? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Or I will keep my plug in, and that's what it means to be in tuned. I think that's what it means to have a relationship with Hashem. A connection with Hashem means being plugged in 24-7 to the source of all creativity, Mm -hmm. to the source of all love, to the source of all life. Wow. Wow. Okay. And I want want to shift this for a second because you're speaking so beautifully about going into our own neshamas, our own souls. Um, I know you just returned from a trip to Israel and there feels like in addition to each person's challenge around what's going on, there's kind of a big thing happening now, right? What's happening in Israel? What's happening in America with anti-Semitism? Like you mentioned, you know, your, your grandparents and parents and the Lubavitcher Rebbe living through history. It feels like we're living through history right now again. Um, you know, wh- what's your take, for lack of a better term? Like, how do you make sense of what's happening right now? To be a Jew, to be a fully aware Jew, I think, is to always live in the vortex of history. To live in the moment where history, the Jewish people somehow always attract this attention that is completely disproportionate with their numbers. Mm -hmm. And if you don't understand what Judaism really is and what the Jewish people are, it can become so confusing. And then we become emotionally sick people because we blame ourselves Mm. and we try to figure out how we can change ourselves in order to fit in and become loved. And I think that's the greatest challenge of the Jewish people. We have so desperately tried to create peace in Israel and abroad to be loved to see a better world, different than the world that our grandparents dealt with under Stalin and Hitler. And as a result of that, we often bend ourselves out of shape, blaming ourselves, trying to appease the enemy and believing that really they want peace as much as us. Mm -hmm. Here I quote Churchill who once said, appeasement is feeding the alligator in the hope that he will eat you last. Mm. So I was, I was now on a trip to Israel. My focus of the trip was simply visiting bereaved families, the wounded in the hospitals, soldiers returning from Gaza and wounded from October 7th, visiting soldiers at army bases, uh, visiting some communities, and especially visiting the kibbutzim and the towns in the southern Israel that were massacred on October 7th, 2023. Um, it was a very, very intense trip. Uh, Israel has lived through a visceral trauma and it's still living through a visceral trauma. I mean, you're talking about tens of thousands of families that have been affected and changed to the core, Mm -hmm. devastated, the loss of loved ones, the torture of loved ones, Uh, 134 hostages still in captivity six months later in the hands and in the tunnels of people who gleefully will cut the throats of Jewish children Mm -hmm will burn Jewish children alive, will rape and mutilate Jewish bodies, will torture them with with joy and glee. It's hard for Jews to digest this. Mm -hmm. Like after the Holocaust, it was hard for Jews to kill Nazis, (laughs) certainly to torture. And and it's talking about Nazis. Mm -hmm. Take a a baby and do what they did with babies on October 7th. It's even hard for me to talk about it. I've cried so much. I mean, like so many other Jews. It's a devastating moment now. It's a devastating moment. And to visit people, you know, I have visited the father of a hostage who freed himself from the tunnel of Hamas. His name was Shabriz. He freed himself from the tunnel of Hamas. He he knew Gaza well because he served there as a soldier earlier. So this young man freed himself from a tunnel of Hamas with two other hostages. They found a home and they finally came out. They were free. And by mistake, the Israeli army shot them. So when they already saw the light, mm-hmm. they were killed. You know, speak, speak to such a father. Yeah. Um, I spoke to Jews who have watched their children be murdered on October 7th. Uh, parents, siblings, and a lot of them. 
So it was a very, very intense experience because the Jewish people are facing now a profound, profound trauma. What is equally painful is often our inability to understand who we are, to understand what we're facing. When you have so many Jews who blame Israel, um, who try to bend over backwards to appease the enemy, who don't understand what the Jewish people represent, what it means to be a Jew, what our responsibility, what our responsibility is today, I think that's dub- I think that's doubly painful. You know what I have learned, and I think what we all must learn is that we are literally experiencing the ultimate power of the Jewish people to make this world a good place, mm. and that's what attracts so much anti-Semitism. Mm. Rationally, this doesn't make sense. I mean, Assad murdered seven hundred thousand people in Syria. Right. Did you see one demonstration? 700,000 people murdered in Syria. I didn't see one demonstration, not in Harvard, right. not in Columbia, not in Oxford, not in NYU, and not in Duke. I didn't see one. Right. In Darfur, millions of people, millions were murdered. I don't see any demonstrations. Mm. You're talking about a little tiny country with 6.6 million Jews. It's like a match on a football field, Mm -hmm. 22 Muslim countries around it, one little tiny Jewish state, and this is the root of all evil in the world. Jews don't constitute one quarter of 1% of humanity. We are smaller than a statistical error of a Chinese census. (laughs) And yet, so much hatred to the Jewish people. For me, I told somebody, somebody was saying, how do you know the Torah is true? I said, oh, just look at the Mm anti-Semitism today. There's no other way of explaining it than realizing that the Jewish people were chosen by God to change the world. Mm. Our role is to transform the world and make it a place of goodness, kindness, morality, holiness, and love. And that is at the core of all anti-Semitism. Don't blame yourself. Realize how successful you are. Realize how holy you are. Why is it that every despot and tyrant for the last 4,000 years has been obsessed with a tiny minority group that simply, from a number perspective, is inconsequential. Mm. So we always find all these excuses. We're rich, we're poor, we're religious, we're very religious, we're secular. It used to be they hate us because we don't have a state. We're parasites. Now we have a state. Oh, we hate you because you have a state. And there's all these explanations in every generation. And what we're dealing with really is, once again, Jewish consciousness needs to be ignited. We have to understand who we are. We are the people who left Egypt and stood at Sinai. God made a covenant with us to sanctify the world. We do it through studying Torah, through celebrating its mitzvah, celebrating Jewish life and becoming a true divine light onto the nations. Not to be embarrassed, not to duck, not to be afraid, and not to surrender ourselves and surrender our souls and sell our, sell our truths. I mean, we are now facing an enemy that would love to see every single Jew in Israel and in the world dead. Mm -hmm. That is what we're facing. And when Jews become insecure and become weak and start apologizing for their existence, it's not only a mockery, it is so painful, it is so disturbing. The world respects Jews who respect themselves. If there'll any, ever be a day that the world will love Israel and the Jewish people, it's when Israel will love Israel. It's when the Jewish people will love and respect their faith, their tradition, their heritage, their history, their God, their people. And the same is true with Israel itself. You know, in the mind of many Israelis and Jews, we created this fictional idea called the Green Line because that would justify a secular democratic Israeli state. In other words, pre-1967 Green Line, you have a majority of Jews, it can be a secular democracy. After the 1967 line, Israel occupied it, let's make a two-state solution, a Palestinian state and a Jewish state, and everything will be fine. And we have invested all of our resources, and that is only one problem. Mm -hmm. Nobody believes it besides the Jewish people. All of the neighbors of the Jewish people say, no, all of Israel is an occupation. We want every single Jew dead. Tel Aviv and Haifa and Herzliya and all parts of Jerusalem, it's all an occupation. You don't belong here. Allah wants you dead. And this is challenging us now to our core. We now have to decide, what are we going to say? Why are we in Israel, for real? Why are we in Israel? We're not in Israel because of the UN. We're not in Israel because of Lord Balfour. We love Balfour, and we like the UN when they say something that is not against uh, morality and life. 
We're, the reason we're in Israel is because thousands of years ago, God gave this as a gift to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses. For thousands of years, every Jew who lived and breathed and walked the face of the earth believed in his or her bones that this is an eternal divine gift to the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. For us to be able to betray that as a betrayal of all of Jewish history, of all of the Jewish story, of all of the Jewish consciousness, and I think the world is almost begging from the Jewish people to speak about this with unwavering clarity and not to be ashamed and not to be embarrassed. This is not an occupation. Moses and Abraham lived thousands of years before Islam was born, before, Mah before Muhammad was born. This is the Jewish eternal homeland. Mm -hmm. they be they, most people, billions of people believe in the Bible. We have to stop being embarrassed of quoting these things. We gave the Bible to the world. We gave God to the world. We gave, I, think, I think this is a time that the Jewish people, once again, are called on to become the ultimate Jews, mm. to become the greatest version of ourselves, mm. to embrace what Jewish history is, what Jewish consciousness is, not to bend over backwards. The, the path of appeasement has come back to haunt us profoundly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the Jewish people need to be united around us. We have each other. Jews are a holy people. We're a divine people. That's why they want to kill every Jewish child, no matter what you look like. You can call yourself an atheist. I have met Jews living in those southern kibbutzim. They were more left-wing than any left-wing Jew you met. Right. I met a woman, she told me, on a daily basis, she would take cancer patients from Gaza to the best of Israeli hospitals and bring them back, believing in brotherhood, believing that ultimately the covenant of humanity is more thick than anything else. The covenant of humanity is thicker than Muslim versus Jewish blood. Mm -hmm. And it's these people who were targeted first, mm -hmm. targeted first with the gliders who came in and slaughtered, literally slaughtered them, shot them, yeah. tortured them. I'm not going to get graphic now about what happened. And I asked this woman, would you still do it today? Would you? And she says, Rea the, reality, the reality has changed. Mm -hmm. I told her you're making a mistake. The reality hasn't changed. Your reality has changed. The reality hasn't changed. There was a Fogel family in Itamar, Every member of the family was slaughtered with a knife, like, like chickens, Friday night in their home. The father was slaughtered, the mother was slaughtered, and all the babies were slaughtered. I remember seeing the pictures. I said, the moment that happened, you should have realized that, that the reality is not the reality that you imagine it to be. You didn't have to wait for 1,400 Jews mm -hmm. to be slaughtered to realize this. The first moment there was a rocket, a rocket that was shot from Gaza to kill Israeli civilians. That was a declaration of war. Mm. We have a weakness. The Jewish people have a weakness. We will sell out our souls and our mothers and our people just to experience a few years of rest. That's our weakness. We want to so believe in peace. And it's coming from a good place. We so want to believe in peace. We so want to believe in love. We will sell out. We will deny reality to be able to get four years of peace. And even those four years are not peaceful. They have dealt with tens of thousands of rockets, tens of thousands of missiles. That was a declaration of war. We just live in fictional illusions and we have to be able to sober up and realize who we are as a people, what our responsibility is and not be apologetic about it. Right, wow. Okay, I have so many questions there, but I wanna be sensitive to our time. I'll, I'll ask you as we close to, you know, we're in the season of Passover, of Pesach now. Um, give us some Torah heading into the holiday or around the holiday. Yeah. In 1937, in 1936, there was a Peel Commission set up by the British to figure out what should be the future of Palestine, which was under the British mandate. David Ben-Gurion, who would later become the first prime minister of Israel, was sitting on the Peel Commission. And uh, Lord Peel, who was doing the interviews, asked Ben-Gurion, and he said, what is your kushan? Kushan was the Arabic term for a deed, like you have a deed for your house. What is your kushan? for this piece of land. You know, all the Arabs I speak to, all the people living here in Palestine, they all have their kushans. Mm -hmm. He said, what is your kushan? And of course, there was a Bible right there because they would swear on the Bible before they would begin the testimony. And Ben-Gurion pointed to the Tanakh, he pointed to the Bible and he said, this is our kushan. It says there hundreds of times that this land was given to the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Abraham walked there, Isaac walked there, Jacob had his dreams here. David built a temple here. Solomon, David and Solomon built a temple here. You're talking about thousands of years before Islam was born. Mm -hmm. Our prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. And then Ben-Gurion did something wise. 
he turned to them and he said, you know, does any one of you know the date that the Mayflower has arrived in Massachusetts, the date? Does anybody know who was the captain on the Mayflower? Does anybody know what food exactly they ate on the Mayflower? Does anybody know exactly how many people were on the Mayflower? And everybody looked at him, you know. Probably you can find a historian who knows this, or if, you know, you, today you can Google it. In 1936, you couldn't Google it. And then Begurian said, and how long ago did the Mayflower come? A few hundred years ago. And now come to my people. Is there a Jewish child who got a basic Jewish education who doesn't know the day that the Jewish people left Egypt? Mm. The food they ate when they left Egypt? Mm. How many Jews left Egypt? Who was the leader who took them out of Egypt? Every Jew with almost the most minimal Jewish education knows Moses, 600,000 males in 20 and 60. Matzah, how do we know? Because we still eat matzah every single year. And we know the exact date. It's called Pesach, Passover, the 15th of Nisan. And Ben-Gurion said, this is our story. We left Egypt, we marched, and it took us 40 years to come to the land of Israel. And I think that's the essence of Passover. We don't tell a story, we relive the story. We eat the food that they ate. You could still feel how stale the matzah is. You know why? It's 3,300 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we say the matzah this year is delicious, it almost tastes like it's 3,000 years yeah. old. We reenact the story every Passover, every experience. And as I once told somebody, you know, just think about it. I'm sitting at a Seder with my children. Yeah. When I was a child, I sat at a Seder with my parents. When they were children, they sat at a Seder with their parents and their grandparents. If we can imagine a large auditorium, a large hall with a Seder table, and each Seder table goes back another generation. Mm. So we have my Seder table or your Seder table with your children, friends, children, maybe brothers, sisters, nephews, nieces, grandchildren. You go to the next Seder table, it's the previous generation. The next one is the previous generation. How many Seder tables would it take to get to Moses? Mm. And the answer is just 30. Wow. People don't think of it that way. Mm -hmm. It's just 30 Seder tables. Mm -hmm. Literally 30, maybe 40, right. 30, 40, and you're back to Moses. This is not a story that could have been created in fiction. This is a story that was lived by millions of people every single year. That's the power of Passover. Mm. I should add one thing, and I heard this from the former chief rabbi of Israel, Rabbi Israel Mayer Lau Shlita, and he told me he visited Ben-Gurion once prior to his death in Zde Boker, which was his farm in the Negev. And he asked Ben-Gurion if this is a true story about the Kushan and the Mayflower, and Ben-Gurion confirmed it. And then he said to Ben-Gurion, and I admire his courage for saying this, he says, you know, Prime Minister, Mr. Prime Minister, I have a question, and that is, if I have a Kushan, and I take the Kushan, and I throw it on the floor, and I step on it, and I trample on it, what do you think would happen? He said, that's not a good idea because you're destroying your kushan. I said, would anyone then take seriously? Would anybody take me seriously about this kushan when I embarrass it? He said, no. So he looked at Ben-Gurion and he said, remember the Tanakh is our kushan. Hmm. When we in Israel step on it, trample on it, don't take it seriously, we are delegitimizing our rights to the Holy Land. Hmm. And his message to Ben-Gurion was, is, Israeli society needs to understand that Judaism is in our DNA. Not everybody in Israel is religious. And to, we don't live in a generation where we enforce religion. It's not going to work. People have to choose their lives voluntarily. But if we disassociate from our DNA, if we disconnect from our kushan, we're disconnecting from ourselves. We're disconnecting from our country. And I think it's one of the mistakes that happened in Israel and in the Jewish world. The two cannot be separated from each other when we do we weaken the fabric of our civilization, of our society, of our army. And I think it's one of the tragedies that Israel is dealing with today. And I think every Jewish leader and every Jewish teacher and every Jewish parent needs to realize this. Rabbi Lau told me, Rabbi Lau said, Ben-Gurion was smart enough not to answer the question. Because this is a, 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 this is a painful reality, I think a little bit of a split personality that many Jews today suffer from. You know, we w love Israel, we want Israel, we believe in Israel. The first generation after the Holocaust, the Holocaust was so visceral and real, mm -hmm. they didn't have a problem. Mm -hmm. Like, this is our country, you like it, great. If not, jump in the lake. Right. Today, it's been 70, 80 years, 80 years since the Holocaust. The students and campuses need to feel the morality of Israel. Mm -hmm. They need to feel the truth of it. 
just to say the Holocaust, it's important. But just because you had a Holocaust, you can't steal my house. Mm -hmm. You had a Holocaust, so find yourself a house in Uganda or somewhere. You can't steal my house because you had a Holocaust. And not every Jew has an answer to that. Mm -hmm. Even spokesmen of Israel don't always have an answer to that. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where important to come back to the Kushan. There's nothing more powerful than our Kushan. And people tell me, oh, but they're not going to believe it. It's a religious argument. Mm -hmm. It's a religious argument. And I say, the most important thing for them is to know that you believe it. Hamas and their supporters say the most outlandish, disgusting things, and the world accepts them. Why? Because they see they're serious. Mm. They feel their authenticity. Mm. They're not embarrassed. Why are we embarrassed? They just need to feel your authenticity. They need to know that for 900 years, every Jewish kid studying in a Jewish school started their studies with Rashi. Rashi lived 900 years ago in France. And the first Rashi in the Bible says that the whole book of Genesis is superfluous because the Torah is a book of law. So why don't you start off with the laws in the book of Exodus? The whole book of Genesis is unnecessary. That's what Rashi says. Rashi's name was Rabbi Solomon. He was the great rabbi, lived in France, and he wrote the most important commentary on the Torah, on the Tanakh, on the Bible, and on the Talmud. And it's his question. And what's his answer? And he's writing in the 10 hundreds during the first crusade in France. No one has a dream of Israel being settled by Jews. It's a fight between Muslims and Christians. Which ones are going to prevail? And that's when Rashi penned this commentary. And he said the reason the book of Genesis was included into the Bible is because one day, the nations of the world are going to come to the Jewish people and say, you guys are a bunch of thieves and thugs. You have stolen this land. You are occupiers. You are a foreign culture that has invaded our land and thrown innocent people out of their homes. And you have no right to be in this land. Get out of here. And Rashi says the Jews will not know what to say. And that's why, he says, the whole book of Genesis was written for the Jewish people to be able to understand and have an answer for themselves and for other people. Mm -hmm and say, this is not an occupation. <laughs> wow. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. I want to first just thank uh, uh, Ellie Schwabel, who made the connection between us for, yes. for bringing us here thank today. Thank you, Ellie. Um, and I want to encourage all of our viewers to check out uh, the yeshiva.net if they want to see more of your content. I hope they'll find you there if they haven't already. Or the YouTube um, channel is also fun. The they can go to my YouTube channel. Great, it's under your YY name. Jacobson. Yeah. YY Jacobson, YouTube anywhere else. That it's a, there's a lot out there. There's WhatsApp communities. Spotify well. podcasts, Fine. WhatsApp communities, yes. Okay. All right, so yeah. look up YY Jacobson. Uh, but on the yeshiva.net, they could sign up for everything. Okay, perfect. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, really. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. And the Chak Hashem To you and to Israel and to all of the Jewish people. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. The Yeshiva.net 